About two hundred years ago there was a poor man working as a laborer on a farm in Lanarkshire. He was what is known as an automan, that is, he had no special work mapped out for him to do, but he was expected to undertake odd jobs of any kind that happened to turn up. One day his master sent him out to cast peats on a piece of moorland that lay on a certain part of the farm. Now this strip of moorland ran up at one end to a curiously shaped crag, known as Merlin's Crag, because, so the country folk said, that famous enchanter had once taken up his abode there. The man obeyed, and being a willing fellow, when he arrived at the moor he set to work with all his might and main. He had lifted quite a quantity of peat from near the crag, when he was startled by the appearance of the very smallest woman that he had ever seen in his life. She was only about two feet high, and she was dressed in a green gown and red stockings, and her long yellow hair was not bound by any ribbon, but hung loosely round her shoulders. She was such a dainty little creature that the astonished countryman stopped working, stuck his spade into the ground, and gazed at her in wonder. His wonder increased when she held up one of her tiny fingers and addressed him in these words, "'What wast thou think if I were to send my husband to uncover thy house? Your mortals think that you can do aught that pleaseth you.' Then, stamping her tiny foot, she added in a voice of command, "'Put back that turf instantly, or thou shalt rue this day.' Now the poor man had often heard of the fairy folk, and of the harm that they could work to unthinking mortals who offended them. So, in fear and trembling, he set to work to undo all his labor and to place every divot in the exact spot from which he had taken it. When he was finished, he looked round for his strange visitor, but she had vanished completely, and he could not tell how nor where. Putting up his spade, he wended his way homewards, and going straight to his master, he told him the whole story, and suggested that in future the peach should be taken from the other end of the moor. But the master only laughed. He was a strong, hardy man, and had no belief in ghosts or elves or fairies, or any other creatures that he could not see. And although he laughed, he was vexed that his servant should believe in such things. So to cure him, as he thought of his superstition, he ordered him to take a horse and cart and go back at once and lift all the peats and bring them to dry in the farmsteading. The poor man obeyed with much reluctance, and was greatly relieved as weeks went on to find that in spite of his having done so, no harm befell him. In fact, he began to think that his master was right, and that the whole thing must have been a dream. So matters went smoothly on, winter passed and spring and summer, until autumn came round once more, and the very day arrived on which the peats had been lifted the year before. That day, as the sun went down, the Aura man left the farm to go home to his cottage, and as his master was pleased with him, because he had been working very hard lately, he had given him a little can of milk as a present to carry home to his wife. So he was feeling very happy, and as he walked along he was humming a tune to himself. His road took him by the foot of Merlin's crag, and as he approached it he was astonished to find himself growing strangely tired. His eyelids dropped over his eyes as if he were going to sleep, and his feet grew as heavy as lead. "'I will sit down and take a rest for a few minutes,' he said to himself. "'The road home never seems so long as it does to-day.' So he sat down on a tuft of grass right under the shadow of the crag and before he knew where he was, he had fallen into a deep and heavy slumber. When he awoke it was near midnight, and the moon had risen on the crag, and he rubbed his eyes, when by its soft light he became aware of a large band of fairies, who were dancing round and round him, singing and laughing, pointing their tiny fingers at him, and shaking their wee fists in his face. The bewildered man rose and tried to walk away from them, but turn in whichever direction he would, the fairies accompanied him, encircling him in a magic ring, out of which he could in no wise go. At last they stopped, and with shrieks of elfin laughter, led the prettiest and daintiest of their companions up to him, and cried, 
Thread a measure, thread a measure. Oh, man, then wilt thou not be so eager to escape from our company. Now the poor laborer was but a clumsy dancer, and he held back with a shamefaced air. But the fairy, who had been chosen to be his partner, reached up and seized his hands. And, lo, some strange magic seemed to enter into his veins, for in a moment he found himself waltzing and whirling, sliding and bowing as if he had done nothing else but dance all his life. And, strangest thing of all, he forgot about his home and his children, and he felt so happy that he had no longer the slightest desire to leave the fairy's company. All night long the merriment went on. The little folk danced and danced as if they were mad, and the farm man danced with them, until at last a shrill sound came over the moor. It was the cock from the farmyard crowing its loudest to welcome the dawn. In an instant the revelry ceased, and the fairies, with cries of alarm, crowded together, and rushed towards the crag, dragging the countrymen along in their midst. As they reached the rock, a mysterious door, which he never remembered having seen before, opened in it of its own accord, and shut again with a crash as soon as the fairy host had all trooped through. The door led into a large, dimly lighted hall full of tiny couches, and here the little folks sank to rest, tired out with their exertions, while the good man sat down on a piece of rock in the corner, wondering what would happen next. But there seemed to be some kind of spell thrown over his senses, for even when the fairies awoke and began to go about their household occupations, and to carry out certain curious practices which he had never seen before, and which, as you will hear, he was forbidden to speak of afterwards, he was content to sit and watch them, without in any way attempting to escape. As it drew toward evening, someone touched his elbow, and he turned round with a start to see the little woman, with the green dress and scarlet stockings, who had remonstrated with him for lifting the turf the year before, standing by his side. "'The divots which thou tookest from the roof of my house have grown once more,' she said, "'and once more it is covered with grass, so thou canst go home again, for justice is satisfied. Thy punishment hath lasted long enough.' but first must thou take thy solemn oath never to tell to mortal ears what thou hast seen whilst thou hast dwelt among us. The countryman promised gladly and took the oath with all due solemnity. Then the door was opened and he was at liberty to depart. His can of milk was standing on the green just where he had laid it down when he went to sleep, and it seemed to him as if it were only yesternight that the farmer had given it to him. But when he reached his home he was speedily undeceived, for his wife looked at him as if he were a ghost, and the children whom he had left wee toddling things were now well-grown boys and girls who stared at him as if he had been an utter stranger. "'Where hast thou been these long, long years?' cried his wife, when she had gathered her wits and seen that it was really he and not a spirit. And how couldst thou find it in thy heart to leave the bairns and me alone? And then he knew that the one day he had passed in fairyland had lasted seven whole years, and he realized how heavy the punishment had been which the wee folk had laid upon him. End of chapter 13 There was once an old grey pussy baudrons, and she went out for a stroll one Christmas morning, to see what she could see, and as she was walking down the burn side, she saw a little robin redbreast hopping up and down on the branches of a briar bush. What a tasty breakfast he would make, thought she to herself. I must try to catch him. So, good morning, robin redbreast, quoth she, sitting down on her tail at the foot of the briar bush and looking up at him. And where mayest thou be going so early on this cold winter's day? "'I'm on my road to the king's palace,' answered Robin cheerily, "'to sing him a song this merry Yule morning. "'That's a pious errand to be travelling on, "'and I wish a good success,' replied Pussy slyly. "'But just hop down a minute before thou goest, "'and I will show thee what a bonny white ring I have round my neck. "'Tis few cats that are marked like me.' "'Then Robin cocked his head on one side, 
and looked down on Pussy Baudrons with a twinkle in his eye. Ha, ha, great Pussy Baudrons, he said. Ha, ha, for I saw thee. Worry the little gray mouse. I have no wish that thou shouldst worry me. And with that he spread his wings and flew away. And he flew and he flew till he lighted on an old sod dyke. And there he saw a greedy old gled sitting, with all his feathers ruffled up as he felt cold. Good morning, Robin Redbreast, cried the greedy old gled, who had had no food since yesterday and was therefore very hungry. And where mayest thou be going this cold winter's day? I'm on my road to the king's palace, answered Robin, to sing him a song this merry yule morn. And he hopped away a yard or two from the gled, for there was a look in his eye that he did not quite like. Thou art a friendly little fellow, remarked the gled sweetly, and thou wish thee good luck on thine errand. But ere thou go on, come nearer me, I pray thee, and I will show thee what a curious feather I have in my wing. Tis said that no other gled in the countryside hath one like it. Like enough, rejoined Robin, hopping still further away, but I will take thy word for it without seeing it. For I saw thee pluck the feathers from the wee linty, and I have no wish that thou shouldst pluck the feathers from me, so I will bid thee good day and go on my journey. The next place on which he rested was a piece of rock that overhung a dark, deep glen, and here he saw a sly old fox looking out of his hole, not two yards below him. Good morning, Robin Redbreast, said the sly old fox, who had tried to steal a fat duck from a farmyard the night before and had barely escaped with his life, and where mayest thou be going so early on this cold winter's day? I'm on my road to the king's palace to sing him a song this merry yule morning, answered Robin, giving the same answer that he had given to the grey pussy baudrons and the greedy gled. Thou wilt get a right good welcome, for his majesty is fond of music, said the wily fox. But ere thou go, just come down and have a look at a black spot which I have on the end of my tail. Tis said that there is not a fox twixt here and the border that hath a spot on his tail like mine. Very like, very like, replied Robin, but I chance to see thee worry and the wee lammy up on the brayside yonder, and I have no wish that thou shouldst try thy teeth on me. So I will e'en go on my way to the king's palace, and thou canst show the spot on thy tail to the next passer-by. So the little robin redbreast flew away once more, and never rested till he came to a bonny valley, with a little burn running through it, and there he saw a rosy-cheeked boy sitting on a log, eating a piece of bread and butter. And he perched on a branch and watched him. Good morning, robin redbreast, and where mayest thou be going so early on this cold winter's day? asked the boy eagerly for he was making a collection of stuffed birds, and he had still to get a robin redbreast. I'm on my way to the king's palace to sing him a song this merry yule morning, answered Robin, hopping down to the ground and keeping one eye fixed on the bread and butter. Come a bit nearer, Robin, said the boy, and I will give thee some crumbs. Na, na, my wee man, chirped the cautious little bird, for I saw thee catch the goldfinch and I have no wish to give thee the chance to catch me. At last he came to the king's palace, and lighted on the window sill, and there he sat and sang the very sweetest song that he could sing, for he felt so happy, because it was the blessed Yuletide, that he wanted everyone else to be happy too. And the king and queen were so delighted with his song as he peeped in at them at their open window, that they asked each other what they could give him as a reward for his kind thought in coming so far to greet them. "'We can give him a wife,' replied the queen, "'who will go home with him and help him to build his nest.' "'And who wilt thou give him for a bride?' asked the king. "'Methinks twould need to be a very tiny lady to match his size.' "'Why, Jenny Wren, of course,' answered the queen. "'She hath looked somewhat dowy of late, "'but this will be the very thing to brighten her up.' Then the king clapped his hands and praised his wife for her happy thought, and wondered that the idea had not struck him before. So Robin Redbreast and Jenny Wren were married amid great rejoicings at the king's palace, 
and the king and queen and all the fine nobles and court ladies danced at their wedding. Then they flew away home to Robin's own countryside and built their nest in the roots of the briar bush, where he had spoken to Pussy Baldrons, and you will be glad to hear that Jenny Wren proved the best little housewife in the world. End of chapter 14 The Dwarfy Stone Far up in a green valley in the island of Hoy stands an immense boulder. It is hollow inside, and the natives of these northern islands call it the Dwarfy Stone, because long centuries ago, so the legend has it, Snorro the Dwarf lived there. Nobody knew where Snorro came from, or how long he had dwelt in the dark chamber inside the Dwarfy Stone. All that they knew about him was that he was a little man, with a queer, twisted, deformed body, and a face of marvelous beauty, which never seemed to look any older, but was always smiling and young. Men said that this was because Snorro's father had been a fairy and not a denizen of earth, who had bequeathed to his son the gift of perpetual youth. But nobody knew whether this were true or not, for the dwarf had inhabited the dwarfy stone long before the oldest man or woman in Hoy had been born. One thing was certain, however, he had inherited from his mother, whom all the men agreed had been mortal, the dangerous qualities of vanity and ambition. And the longer he lived, the more vain and ambitious did he become, until at last he always carried a mirror of polished steel round his neck, into which he constantly looked in order to see the reflection of his handsome face. And he would not attend to the country people who came to seek his help, unless they bowed themselves humbly before him, and spoke to him as if he were a king. I say that the country people sought his help, for he spent his time, or appeared to spend it, in collecting herbs and simples on the hillsides, which he carried home with him to his dark abode, and distilled medicines and potions from them, which he sold to his neighbors at wondrous high prices. He was also the possessor of a wonderful leathern-covered book, clasped with clasps of brass over which he would pour for hours together, and out of which he would tell the simple islanders their fortunes, if they would. For they feared the book almost as much as they feared Snorro himself, for it was whispered that it had once belonged to Odin, and they crossed themselves for protection, as they named the mighty enchanter. But all the time they never guessed the real reason why Snorro chose to live in the dwarfy stone. I will tell you why he did so. Not very far from the stone there was a curious hill, shaped exactly like a wart. It was known as the Wart Hill of Hoy, and men said that somewhere in the side of it was hidden a wonderful carbuncle, which, when it was found, would bestow on its finder marvellous magic gifts health, wealth, and happiness, everything, in fact, that a human being could desire. And the curious thing about this carbuncle was that it was said that it could be seen at certain times if only the people who were looking for it were at the right spot at the right moment. Now Snorro had made up his mind that he would find this wonderful stone. So, while he pretended to spend all his time in reading his great book or distilling medicines from his herbs, he was really keeping a keen lookout during his wanderings, noting every tuft of grass or piece of rock under which it might be hidden. And at night, when everyone else was asleep, he would creep out with pickaxe and spade to turn over the rocks or dig over the turf in hope of finding the long-sought-for treasure underneath them. He was always accompanied on these occasions by an enormous grey-headed raven who lived in the cave along with him and who was his bosom friend and companion. The islanders feared this bird of ill omen as much, perhaps, as they feared its master, for although they went to consult Snorro in all their difficulties and perplexities and bought medicines and love potions from him, they always looked upon him with a certain dread feeling that there was something weird and uncanny about him. Now, at the time we are speaking of, Orkney was governed by two earls who were half-brothers. Paul, the elder, was a tall, handsome man, 
with dark hair and eyes like sloes. All the country people loved him, for he was so skilled in knightly exercises, and had such a sweet and loving nature that no one could help being fond of him. Old people's eyes would brighten at the sight of him, and the little children would run out to greet him as he rode by their mother's doors. And this was the more remarkable because, with all his winning manner, he had such a lack of conversation that men called him Paul the Silent, or Paul the Taciturn. Harold, on the other hand, was as different from his brother as night is from day. He was fair-haired and blue-eyed, and he had gained for himself the name of Harold the Orator, because he was always free of speech and ready with his tongue. But for all this he was not a favorite, for he was haughty and jealous and quick-tempered, and the old folks' eyes did not brighten at the sight of him, and the babes, instead of toddling out to greet him, hid their faces in their mother's skirts when they saw him coming. Harold could not help knowing that the people liked his silent brother best, and the knowledge made him jealous of him, so a coldness sprang up between them. Now it chanced one summer that Earl Harold went on a visit to the King of Scotland, accompanied by his mother, the Countess Helga, and her sister, the Countess Fraukirk. And while he was at court, he met a charming young Irish lady, the Lady Morna, who had come from Ireland to Scotland, to attend upon the Scottish Queen. She was so sweet and good and gentle that Earl Harold's heart was won, and he made up his mind that she, and only she, should be his bride. But although he had paid her much attention, Lady Morna had sometimes caught glimpses of his jealous temper. She had seen an evil expression in his eyes, and had heard him speak sharply to his servants, and she had no wish to marry him. So, to his great amazement, she refused the honor which he offered her, and told him that she would prefer to remain as she was. Earl Harold ground his teeth in silent rage, but he saw that it was no use pressing his suit at that moment, so what he could not obtain by his own merits, he determined to obtain by guile. Accordingly, he begged his mother to persuade the Lady Morna to go back with them on a visit, hoping that when she was alone with him in Orkney, he would be able to overcome her prejudice against him, and induce her to become his wife, and all the while he never remembered his brother Paul, or if he did, he never thought it possible that he could be his rival. But that was just the very thing that happened. The Lady Morna, thinking no evil, accepted the Countess Helga's invitation, and no sooner had the party arrived back in Orkney than Paul, charmed with the grace and beauty of the fair Irish maiden, fell head over ears in love with her, and the Lady Morna, from the very first hour that she saw him, returned his love. Of course this state of things could not long go on hidden, and when Harold realized what had happened, his anger and jealousy knew no bounds. Seizing a dagger, he rushed up to the turret where his brother was sitting in his private apartments, and threatened to stab him to the heart if he did not promise to give up all thoughts of winning the lovely stranger. But Paul met him with pleasant words. "'Calm thyself, brother,' he said. "'It is true that I love the lady, but that is no proof that I shall win her. Is it likely that she will choose me, whom all men name Paul the Silent?' when she hath the chance of marrying you, whose tongue moves so swiftly that to you is given the proud title of Harold the Orator? At these words Harold's vanity was flattered, and he thought that, after all, his stepbrother was right, and that he had a very small chance with his meagre gift of speech of being successful in his suit. So he threw down his dagger, and shaking hands with him, begged him, to pardon his unkind thoughts, and went down the winding stair again in high good humor with himself and all the world. By this time it was coming near to the Feast of Yule, and at that festival it was the custom for the Earl and his court to leave Kirkwall for some weeks, and go to the great palace of Orphir, nine miles distant. And in order to see that everything was ready, Earl Paul took his departure, 
some days before the others. The evening before he left he chanced to find the Lady Morna sitting alone in one of the deep windows of the great hall. She had been weeping, for she was full of sadness at the thought of his departure, and at the sight of her distress the kind-hearted young earl could no longer contain himself. But, folding her in his arms, he whispered to her how much he loved her, and begged her to promise to be his wife. She agreed willingly. Hiding her rosy face on his shoulder, she confessed that she had loved him from the very first day that she had seen him, and ever since that moment she had determined that, if she could not wed him, she would wed no other man. For a little time they sat together, rejoicing in their new-found happiness. Then Earl Paul sprang to his feet. "'Let us go and tell the good news to my mother and brother,' he said. "'Harold may be disappointed at first, for I know, sweetheart, he would fain have had thee for his own. But his good heart will soon overcome all that, and he will rejoice with us also.' But the Lady Morna shook her head. She knew, better than her lover, what Earl Harold's feelings would be, and she would fain put off the evil hour. "'Let us hold our peace till after Yule,' she pleaded. "'It will be a joy to keep our secret to ourselves for a little space. There will be time enough, then, to let all the world know.' Rather reluctantly, Earl Paul agreed, and next day he set off for the palace at Orphir, leaving his lady-love behind him. Little he guessed the danger he was in, for, all unknown to him, his step-aunt, Countess Frau Kirk, had chanced to be in the hall the evening before, hidden behind a curtain, and she had overheard every word that Morna and he had spoken, and her heart was filled with black rage. For she was a hard, ambitious woman, and she had always hated the young Earl, who was no blood relation to her, and who stood in the way of his brother, her own nephew, for, if Paul were only dead, Harold would be the sole Earl of Orkney. And now that he had stolen the heart of the Lady Morna, whom her own nephew loved, her hate and anger knew no bounds. She had hastened off to her sister's chamber as soon as the lovers had parted, and there the two women had remained talking together till the chilly dawn broke in the sky. Next day a boat went speeding over the narrow channel of water that separates Pomona on the mainland from Hoy. In it sat a woman, but who she was or what she was like no one could say, for she was covered from head to foot with a black cloak, and her face was hidden behind a thick dark veil. Snorro the dwarf knew her even before she laid aside her trappings, for Countess Fraukirk was no stranger to him. In the course of her long life she had often had occasion to seek his aid to help her in her evil deeds, and she had always paid him well for his services, in yellow gold. He therefore welcomed her gladly, but when he had heard the nature of her errand his smiling face grew grave again, and he shook his head. "'I have served thee well, lady, in the past,' he said, "'but methinks that this thing goeth beyond my courage.' for to compass an earl's death is a weighty matter, especially when he is so well beloved, as is Earl Paul. Thou knowest why I have taken up my abode in this lonely spot, how I hope some day to light upon the magic carbuncle. Thou knowest also how the people fear me and hate me too, forsooth, and if the young earl died and suspicion fell on me, I must needs fly the island, for my life would not be worth a grain of sand, then my chance of success would be gone. Nay, I cannot do it, lady, I cannot do it. But the wily countess offered him much gold and bribed him higher and higher, first with wealth, then with success, and lastly she promised to obtain for him a high post at the court of the King of Scotland, and at that his ambition stirred within him. His determination gave way, and he consented to do what she asked. I will summon my magic loom, said he, and weave a piece of cloth of finest texture and of marvellous beauty, and before I weave it I will so poison the thread with a magic potion that when it is fashioned into a garment, whoever puts it on, 
will die ere he hath worn it many minutes thou art a clever knave answered the countess a cruel smile lighting up her evil face and thou shalt be rewarded let me have a couple of yards of this wonderful web and i will make a bonny waistcoat for my fine young earl and give it to him as a yuletide gift then i reckon that he will not see the year out that will he not said dwarf snorro with a malicious grin and the two parted after arranging that the piece of cloth should be delivered at the palace of orfear on the day before christmas eve now when the countess frau kirk had been away upon her wicked errand strange things were happening at the castle of kirkwall for harold encouraged by his brother's absence offered his heart and hand once more to the lady morna once more she refused him and in order to make sure that the scene should not be repeated she told him that she had plighted her troth to his brother when he heard that this was so rage and fury were like to devour him mad with anger he rushed from her presence flung himself upon his horse and rode away in the direction of the seashore while he was galloping wildly along his eyes fell on the snow-clad hills of hoy rising up across the strip of sea that divided the one island from the other and his thoughts flew at once to snorro the dwarf who he had had occasion as well as his step-aunt to visit in bygone days i have it he cried stupid fool that i was not to think of it at once i will go to snorro and buy from him a love potion which will make my lady morna hate my precious brother and turn her thoughts kindly towards me so he made haste to hire a boat and soon he was speeding over the tossing waters on his way to the island of hoy when he arrived there he hurried up the lonely valley to where the dwarfy stone stood and he had no difficulty in finding its uncanny occupant for snorro was standing at the hole that served as a door his raven on his shoulder gazing placidly at the setting sun a curious smile crossed his face when hearing the sound of approaching footsteps he turned round and his eyes fell on the young noble what bringeth thee here sir earl he asked gaily for he scented more gold a come for a love potion said harold and without more ado he told the whole story to the wizard i will pay thee for it he added if thou wilt give it to me quickly snorro looked at him from head to foot blind must the maiden be sir orator he said who needeth a love potion to make her fancy so gallant a knight earl harold laughed angrily it is easier to catch a sunbeam than a woman's roving fancy he replied i have no time for jesting for hearken old man there is a proverb that saith time and tide wait for no man so i need not expect the tide to wait for me the potion i must have and that instantly snorro saw that he was in earnest so without a word he entered his dwelling and in a few minutes returned with a small vial in his hand which was full of a rosy liquid pour the contents of this into the lady morna's wine cup said he and i warrant thee that before four and twenty hours have passed she will love thee better than thou lovest her now then he waved his hand as if to dismiss his visitor and disappeared into his dwelling-place earl harold made all speed back to the castle but it was not until one or two days had elapsed that he found a chance to pour the love potion into the lady morna's wine-cup but at last one night at supper he found an opportunity of doing so and waving away the little page-boy he handed it to her himself she raised it to her lips but she only made a pretense at drinking for she had seen the hated earl fingering the cup and she feared some deed of treachery when he had gone back to his seat she managed to pour the whole of the wine on the floor and smiled to herself at the look of satisfaction that came over harold's face as she put down the empty cup his satisfaction increased for from that moment she felt so afraid of him that she treated him with great kindness hoping that by doing so she would keep in his good graces until the court moved to orfear 
and her own true love could protect her. Harold, on his side, was delighted with her graciousness, for he felt certain that the charm was beginning to work, and that his hopes would soon be fulfilled. A week later the court removed to the royal palace at Orphir, where Earl Paul had everything in readiness for the reception of his guests. Of course he was overjoyed to meet Lady Morna again, and she was overjoyed to meet him, for she felt that she was now safe from the unwelcome attentions of Earl Harold. But to Earl Harold the sight of their joy was as gall and bitterness, and he could scarcely contain himself, although he still trusted in the efficacy of Snorro the dwarf's love potion. As for the Countess Frau Kirk and Countess Helga, they looked forward eagerly to the time when the magic web would arrive, out of which they hoped to fashion a fatal gift for Earl Paul. At last, the day before Christmas Eve, the two wicked women were sitting in the Countess Helga's chamber, talking of the time when Earl Harold would rule alone in Orkney, when a tap came to the window, and on looking round they saw dwarf Snorro's, gray-headed raven perched on the sill, a sealed packet in its beak. They opened the casement, and with a hoarse croak, the creature let the packet drop on to the floor. Then it flapped its great wings and rose slowly into the air again, its head turned in the direction of Hoy. With fingers that trembled with excitement, they broke the seals and undid the packet. It contained a piece of the most beautiful material that any one could possibly imagine, woven in all the colors of the rainbow and sparkling with gold and jewels. "'Twill make a bonny waistcoat!' exclaimed the Countess Fraukirk with an unholy laugh. "'The silent Earl will be a braw man when he gets it on.' Then, without more ado, they set to work to cut out and sew the garment. All that night they worked, and all next day, till, late in the afternoon, when they were putting in the last stitches, hurried footsteps were heard ascending the winding staircase, and Earl Harold burst open the door. His cheeks were red with passion, and his eyes were bright, for he could not but notice that, now that she was safe at Orphir under her true love's protection, the Lady Morna's manner had grown cold and distant again, and he was beginning to lose faith in Snorro's charm. Angry and disappointed, he had sought his mother's room to pour out his story of vexation to her. He stopped short, however, when he saw the wonderful waistcoat lying on the table, all gold and silver and shining colors. It was like a fairy garment, and its beauty took his breath away. "'For whom hast thou purchased that?' he asked, hoping to hear that it was intended for him. "'Tis a Christmas gift for thy brother Paul,' answered his mother and she would have gone on to tell him how deadly a thing it was, had he given her time to speak. But her words fanned his fury into madness, for it seemed to him that this hated brother of his was claiming everything. "'Everything is for Paul. I am sick of his very name,' he cried. "'By my troth he shall not have this!' And he snatched the vest from the table. It was in vain that his mother and his aunt threw themselves at his feet, begging him to lay it down, and warning him that there was not a thread in it which was not poisoned. He paid no heed to their words, but rushed from the room, and, drawing it on, ran downstairs with a reckless laugh to show the Lady Morna how fine he was. Alas, alas, scarce had he gained the hall than he fell to the ground in great pain. Everyone crowded round him, and the two countesses, terrified now by what they had done, tried in vain to tear the magic vest from his body, but he felt that it was too late. The deadly poison had done its work, and waving them aside, he turned to his brother, who in great distress had knelt down and taken him tenderly in his arms. "'I wronged thee, Paul,' he gasped, "'for thou hast ever been true and kind. Forgive me in thy thoughts, and—' he added, gathering up his strength for one last effort, and pointing to the two wretched women who had wrought all this misery. Beware of those two women, for they seek to take thy life. 
and his head sank back on his brother's shoulder, and, with one long sigh, he died. When he learned what had happened, and understood where the waistcoat came from, and for what purpose it had been intended, the anger of the silent earl knew no bounds. He swore a great oath that he would be avenged, not only on Snorro the dwarf, but also on his wicked stepmother and her cruel sister. His vengeance was balked, however, for in the panic and confusion that followed Harold's death, the two countesses slipped out of the palace and fled to the coast, and took boat in haste to Scotland, where they had great possessions, and where they were much looked up to, and where no one would believe a word against them. But retribution fell on them in the end, as it always does fall, sooner or later, on everyone who is wicked or selfish or cruel, for the Norsemen invaded the land, and their castle was set on fire, and they perished miserably in the flames. When Earl Paul found that they had escaped, he set out in hot haste for the island of Hoy, for he was determined that the dwarf at least should not escape. But when he came to the dwarfy stone, he found it silent and deserted, all trace of its uncanny occupants having disappeared. No one knew what had become of them. A few people were inclined to think that the dwarf and his raven had accompanied the Countess Fraukirk and the Countess Helga on their flight, but the greater part of the islanders held to the belief, which I think was the true one, that the powers of the air spirited Snorro away and shut him up in some unknown place as a punishment for his wickedness, and that his raven accompanied him. At any rate, he was never seen again by any living person, and wherever he went he lost all chance of finding the magic carbuncle. As for the silent Earl and his Irish sweetheart, they were married as soon as Earl Harold's funeral was over, and for hundreds of years afterwards, when the inhabitants of the Orkney Isles wanted to express great happiness, they said, As happy as Earl Paul and the Countess Morna. End of chapter 15 Cannonby Dick and Thomas of Erkeldoon It chanced long years ago that a certain horse-dealer lived in the south of Scotland near the border, not very far from Longtown. He was known as Cannonby Dick, and as he went up and down the country he almost always had a long string of horses behind him, which he bought at one fair and sold at another generally managing to turn a good big penny by the transaction. He was a very fearless man, not easily daunted, and the people who knew him used to say that if Cannonby Dick dare not attempt a thing, no one else need be asked to do it. One evening, as he was returning from a fair at some distance from his home, with a pair of horses which he had not succeeded in selling, he was riding over Bowden Moor, which lies to the west of the Eildon Hills. These hills are, as all men know, the scene of some of the most famous of Thomas the Rhymer's prophecies, and also, as men say, they are the sleeping place of King Arthur and his knights, who rest under the three high peaks, waiting for the mystic call that shall awake them. But little wrecked the horse-dealer of Arthur and his knights, nor yet of Thomas the Rhymer. He was riding along at a snail's pace, thinking over the bargains which he had made at the fair that day, and wondering when he was likely to dispose of his two remaining horses. All at once he was startled by the approach of a venerable man with white hair and an old-world dress, who seemed almost to start out of the ground, so suddenly did he make his appearance. When they met the stranger stopped, and to Cannonby Dick's great amazement, asked him for how much he would be willing to part with his horses. The wily horse-dealer thought that he saw a chance of driving a good bargain, for the stranger looked a man of some consequence, so he named a good round sum. The old man tried to bargain with him, but when he found that he had not much chance of succeeding, for no one ever did succeed in inducing Cannonby Dick to sell a horse for a less sum than he named for it at first, 
he agreed to buy the animals, and pulling a bag of gold from the pocket of his queerly cut breeches, he began to count out the price. As he did so, Canon B. Dick got another shock of surprise, for the gold that the stranger gave him was not the gold that was in use at the time, but was fashioned into unicorns and bonnet pieces and other ancient coins, which would be of no use to the horse-dealer in his everyday transactions. But it was good pure gold, and he took it gladly, for he knew that he was selling his horses at about half as much again as they were worth. So, thought he to himself, surely I cannot be the loser in the long run. Then the two departed, but not before the old man had commissioned Dick to get him other good horses at the same price, the only stipulation he made being that Dick should always bring them to the same spot after dark, and that he should always come alone. And as time went on, the horse-dealer found that he had indeed met a good customer, for whenever he came across a suitable horse, he had only to lead it over Bowden Moor after dark, and he was sure to meet the mysterious white-headed stranger who always paid him for the animal in old-fashioned golden pieces. And he might have been selling horses to him yet, for aught I know, had it not been for his one failing. Canon B. Dick was apt to get very thirsty, and his ordinary customers, knowing this, took care always to provide him with something to drink. The old man never did so. He paid down his money and led away his horses, and there was an end of the matter. But one night, Dick, being even more thirsty than usual, and feeling sure that his mysterious friend must live somewhere in the neighborhood, seeing that he was always wandering about the hillside when everyone else was asleep, hinted that he would be very glad to go home with him, and have a little refreshment. "'He would need to be a brave man who asks to go home with me,' returned the stranger. "'But if thou wilt, thou canst follow me. Only remember this. If thy courage fail thee at that which thou wilt behold, thou wilt rue it all thy life.' Canon B. Dick laughed long and loud. "'My courage hath never failed me yet,' he cried. "'Beshrew me if I will let it fail now.' So lead on, old man, and I will follow. Without a word, the stranger turned and began to ascend a narrow path, which led to a curious hillock, which from its shape was called by the country folk the Luckin Hare. It was supposed to be a great haunt of witches, and as a rule nobody passed that way after dark, if they could possibly help it. Canon B. Dick was not afraid of witches, however, so he followed his guide with a bold step up the hillside. But it must be confessed that he felt a little startled when he saw him turn down what seemed to be an entrance to a cavern, especially as he never remembered having seen any opening in the hillside there before. He paused for a moment, looking round him in perplexity, wondering where he was being taken, and his conductor glanced at him scornfully. "'You can go back if you will,' he said, a warn thee thou wert goin' on a journey that would try thy courage to the utmost. There was a jeering note in his voice that touched Dick's pride. Who said that I was afraid, he retorted. I was just taking note of where this passage stands on the hillside, so as to know it another time. The stranger shrugged his shoulders. Time enough to look for it when thou wouldst visit it again, he said, and then he pursued his way with Dick following closely at his heels. After the first yard or two they were enveloped in thick darkness, and the horse-dealer would have been sore put to keep near his guide had not the latter held out his hand for him to grasp. But after a little space a faint glimmering of light began to appear, which grew clearer and clearer, until at last they found themselves in an enormous cavern lit by flaming torches, which were stuck here and there in sconces in the rocky walls and which, although they served to give light enough to see by, yet threw such ghostly shadows on the floor that they only seemed to intensify the gloom that hung over the vast apartment. And the curious thing about this mysterious cave was that, along one side of it, ran a long row of horse stalls, just like one would find in a stable, 
and in each stall stood a coal-black charger, saddled and bridled as if ready for the fray, and on the straw by every horse's side lay the gallant figure of a knight, clad from head to foot in coal-black armor, with a drawn sword in his mailed hand. But not a horse moved, not a chain rattled. Knights and steeds alike were silent and motionless, looking exactly as if some strange enchantment had been thrown over them, and they had been suddenly turned into black marble. There was something so awesome in the still cold figures, and in the unearthly silence that brooded over everything, that Canon B. Dick, reckless and daring though he was, felt his courage waning and his knees beginning to shake under him. In spite of these feelings, however, he followed the old man up the hall to the far end of it, where there was a table of ancient workmanship, on which was placed a glittering sword and a curiously wrought hunting horn. When they reached this table, the stranger turned to him and said, with great dignity, Thou hast heard, good man, of Thomas of Erkeldoon, Thomas the Rhymer, as men call him, he who went to dwell for a time with the queen of fairyland and from her received the gifts of truth and prophecy canonby dick nodded for as the wonderful soothsayer's name fell on his ears his heart sank within him and his tongue seemed to cleave to the roof of his mouth if he had been brought there to parley with thomas the rhymer then he had laid himself open to all the eldritch powers of darkness i that speak to thee am he went on the white-haired stranger and i have permitted thee thus to have thy desire and follow me hither in order that i may try of what stuff thou art made before thee lies a horn and a sword he that will sound the one or draw the other shall if his courage fail not be king over the whole of britain i thomas the rhymer have spoken it and as thou knowest my tongue cannot lie but list thee the outcome of it all depends on thy bravery and it will be a light task or a heavy according as thou layest hand on sword or horn first now dick was more versed in giving blows than in making music and his first impulse was to seize the sword then come what might he had something in his hand to defend himself with but just as he was about to lift it the thought struck him that if the place were full of spirits as he felt sure that it must be this action of him might be taken to mean defiance and might cause them to band themselves together against him so changing his mind he picked up the horn with a trembling hand and blew a blast upon it which however was so weak and feeble that it could scarce be heard at the other end of the hall the result that followed was enough to appall the stoutest heart. Thunder rolled in, crashing peals through the immense hall. The charmed knights and their horses woke in an instant from their enchanted sleep. The knights sprang to their feet and seized their swords, brandishing them round their heads, while their great black chargers stamped and snorted and ground their bits as if eager to escape from their stalls, and where a moment before all had been stillness and silence there was now a scene of wild din and excitement now was the time for canon b dick to play the man if he had done so all the rest of his life might have been different but his courage failed him and he lost his chance terrified at seeing so many threatening faces turned towards him he dropped the horn and made one weak undecided effort to pick up the sword but ere he could do so a mysterious voice sounded from somewhere in the hall and these were the words that it uttered woe to the coward that ever he was born who did not draw the sword before he blew the horn and before dick knew what he was about a perfect whirlwind of cold raw air tore through the cavern carrying the luckless horse-dealer along with it and hurrying him along the narrow passage through which he had entered, dashing him down outside on a bank of loose stones and shale. He fell right to the bottom, and was found, with little life left in him, 
next morning by some shepherds to whom he had just strength enough left to whisper the story of his weird and fearful adventure end of chapter sixteen